In this video, I'm going to walk you all through my basic approach and search pattern when reading an MRI of the cervical spine. I'll give you some tips on the different sequences, I'll go through my search pattern, and then at the end of the video, I'll go through some example cases to explain some of the things that I reference in the earlier part of this video. So what I have here pulled up on my screen is the sagittal T1. This is one of the sequences that you should always get when you're looking at an MRI of the cervical spine. The T1 sequence is really good for looking at the bones. So that's usually where I start. So I start first with the skull base and make my way down all the way down to what I can see of the thoracic spine. And I look at every single vertebra, make sure I don't see any lesion, any definite fracture, any other significant abnormality. So that's what I'm doing now. And after I'm done looking at all the bones in their entirety, I think about the alignment of the cervical spine. I pay attention to the craniocervical junction and the alignment of C1 with the skull base, in this case that is normal. In addition to the alignment of C1 with C2, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of the craniocervical junction and the different measurements in this video. After thinking about the alignment of the craniocervical junction, I pay attention to the alignment of the vertebral bodies of the cervical and what I can see of the thoracic spine, and I just trace a line along the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, what I'm doing now, then along the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, and I look for any significant listhesis. Listhesis comes in two forms, be it anterolisthesis or retrolisthesis. Anterolisthesis is when there is forward subluxation of the top vertebra with respect to the one below it, so anterolisthesis of C2 on C3 would be C2 being displaced anteriorly with respect to C3. On the contrary, retrolisthesis of let's say C3 on C4 would be posterior subluxation of C3 with respect to C4. You can then look at the different facet joints at every level. Here is one of the facet joints here that I'm circling and just make sure that those look normal. You can have jumped or perched facets particularly in the setting of trauma, that can indicate that there's ligamentous injury and you start to have some malalignment of the facet joints within the cervical spine. After I'm done looking at the alignment, I take a quick look at the disc space heights. Here are the discs here, and I just make note of if there's been significant disc height loss, which is commonly seen as we get older, and we have degeneration of the actual discs. In this case, I would say these are relatively normal disc spaces. I then pay attention to the spinal canal. I look at the spinal canal in every sequence. The spinal canal runs here, which is what I'm partially outlining. Within the canal, you have the cerebrospinal fluid, which is in the subarachnoid space. And within the canal, you have the actual cord, which is what I'm pointing to here, the gray structure that you can see continuing inferiorly from the brainstem. And we see all of the cervical cord here, as well as a little bit of the thoracic cord down here as well. I also pay close attention to the canal. I look at the canal on every sequence. Things that you can find in the canal that you definitely want to catch are hemorrhage, phlegmon, which is like infectious, enhancing soft tissue, and then one step further beyond phlegmon is abscess. The pre-contrast T1 is a good place to start by looking at those things, but you also want to look at your T2s, and if you have a post-contrast image, of course, you want to look at your post-contrast images as well. We're going to skip the contrast phases on this video. What I have here pulled up now is the T2. T2 is the good sequence for really looking at the cord. There are different causes of cord signal abnormality. The major causes to always think about when you see cord signal abnormality are neoplasm, radiation-related change, compression or trauma, demyelination, and then neoplasm. Those, that's a good place to start with your differential diagnosis. And the T2 is a really good sequence to look at the cord. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm going through looking at the cord. In this case, this is a normal cord, so I don't see any significant cord signal abnormality that would ring any alarm bells. In addition to looking at the cord on the T2, I also, again, pay attention to that canal. The canal is just a place where you don't want to miss something because a lot of significant pathology happens within the canal, particularly the epidural space, which is where you'll find that phlegmon abscess or potentially epidural hemorrhage, which can happen in the setting of trauma, but also spontaneously, particularly in patients that take anticoagulation medications. So in this case, this is a normal cord. This is a normal canal. Let's move on to the next sequence. So what I have here now is the STIR sequence. I really like the STIR sequence. I think it's a very useful sequence to pay a lot of attention to and to spend a lot of time on. The STIR sequence is a good thing at identifying pathology. It's very sensitive for identifying different types of pathology. And generally on the STIR sequence, pathology shows up as bright. So if you see brightness within a bone, think a fracture, think a tumor, some sort of lesion, you can look for brightness within the prevertebral space, such as like a prevertebral edema if there's trauma. The STIR sequence is a great sequence at looking at all the ligaments. In this case, all of these ligaments are normal, but this is your sequence to look for ligamentous injury where you'll see hyperintensity or brightness within the ligaments. 
And stir is an even more sensitive sequence than your T2s at looking at the chord. So I always look at the chord beginning at the brainstem to where it becomes the chord all the way down to the upper part of the thoracic cord. I look at the entire chord, both on the T2s and on the stirs, just to be as thorough as possible and ensure that you don't miss something. Again, that good differential to always think about is radiation-related change, trauma, demyelination, infection, or neoplasm. This is a good example of a normal stir sequence. So if you spend some time looking at this type of sequence, in a normal case, you'll get an idea of what normal brightness is and what brightness is pathologic or not normal. In this case, this is a normal stir. So if you can go through an image like this and you can find these on radiopedia.com, it's one of my favorite websites to study radiology, you can get a sense of what normal is. And then by knowing normal, you can identify abnormal. A lot of these cervical spine MRIs are ordered in the outpatient setting to evaluate for degenerative disease. So a really important job of the radiologist is to go level by level and grade the stenosis. I talked about this in my MRI lumbar spine video in case you're interested and watching that one too. And it's really the same thing here. You have to go through and look at the canal and the neural foramen, and we'll talk about the specifics of those in just a second, and grade how narrow you think those are. And that helps the surgeons potentially identify an operative level where they can go in and potentially alleviate the patient's symptoms. So it's important to go through and do that on every MRI cervical spine. I like to use the sagittal and axials and have them just next to each other as I'm grading the different levels. As you know, radiologists have multiple monitors, so I really have the axial, which is the sequence that I have pulled up here now. This is our axial, and then I have the sagittal, which I was just showing y'all sagittals earlier, I have those pulled up next to each other to grade each level. So I've got a T2 weighted sequence pulled up first, and this is where I like to start by looking at the canal. I look at it in the axial, and I scroll inferiorly, looking at the canal at every single level. I'm doing that a little faster than I normally do, but in this case, this is a patent canal and there's no significant stenosis. I'll show you an example of stenosis later, but notice the bright CSF that surrounds the cord. The cord is bathed within the CSF. This is the cord here in the axial. The CSF, as you can see, is outlining the cord. This is a good example of a normal appearance of the canal. So I'm going down at every level and looking at the canal. After looking at the canal, you then have to think about the neural foramen. So a neural foramen is one of these structures that I'm circling now. This is the neural foramen where the cervical nerve roots exit. So there are a couple things that can cause stenosis of the foramen. The first thing that you need to think about is uncovertebral hypertrophy. There's something called the uncovertebral joint, which is basically, I think of it as where the two cervical vertebra articulate with each other. They articulate at a joint. As there is wear and tear on that joint, you can have osteophyte formation. Osteophyte is basically reactive bone or bony overgrowth. That bony overgrowth can narrow the foramen. And that same process can happen at the facet joints. These are for the facet joints they are posterior, the uncle vertebral joint is anterior. The two of these things can contribute with each other to narrow the neural foramen. The other thing we always think about are discs or disc osteophyte complexes. Those are the three main causes of stenosis in the cervical spine. So I go down and back up and look at every single neural foramen at every level. In this case, this one's easy because they're all wide open, they're not stenosed. So this is a good example of patent neural foramen. Once you have an idea of what not stenose foramen are, you can then get an idea of what mild, moderate, and severe stenosis looks like. I like to then go back to my sagittal, and I'm, again, I'm doing this kind of at the same time, but for the sake of this video, I like to look at the canal and the sagittal. Again, your canal is here. And just make sure there's a healthy amount of CSF surrounding the cord, which is seen centrally here. And this is a sagittal image depicting a very wide open or patent spinal canal. So now I'm gonna show you a few examples. I'm switching over to the first one now. So I talked about always looking in the canal and I look at it in the different sequences. In this case, this is a sagittal T1. We know it's T1 because the CSF is dark. And as you can see here, there's something abnormal and I'm pointing to it here with my arrows. It's between my two arrows here. This is epidural hemorrhage. So this collection is actually contouring and pushing on the cord. You can see the posterior margin of the cord here is being effaced by this collection that's back here. So I'm now in the axial plane. As you can see in the axial plane, we have something that's pushing on the cord. Here's the cord here. It's being displaced to the left laterally. It's being displaced by this is the epidural hemorrhage here, kind of mixed intensity, it's bright and dark. But that's the type of thing you look for when you're looking at the canal. So in the final case here, I have pulled up a sagittal T2. What I want to demonstrate here is cervical canal stenosis and the related cord signal abnormality. So notice this brightness in the cord, you can see it at this level here. And there is stenosis at this level 
the spinal cord is being pushed on by what looks like probably mostly disc. And because the spinal cord is being pushed, it has this cord signal abnormality, which is right here that I pointed to earlier. But this is an example of compressive cord signal abnormality and something that you can catch in the cord. And it's an important thing to let the clinician know. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope it helps at least get you started. The more of normal that you identify, the easier it'll be to determine what abnormal is. Hopefully this video gives you a basic idea of the sequences and a way you can initially start when you're looking at an MRI of the cervical spine. Thanks for watching and see you next time.